I'm going to call the Sheboygan Common Council Committee of the Meeting, a Committee of the Whole Meeting to Order. Uh, roll call, please. Belt. Here. <clears throat> Boren. Here. Carlson. Here. Decker. Here. Common. Here. Hammond. Here. Heideman. Excused. Kath. Here. Kittleson is here. Matichek. Um, about 15 minutes late, probably. Rinfleisch? Here. Raisler? Here. Sampson? Here. Van Akron? Here. Vanderweel? Here. And Versi? Uh, Alderman Versi also will be here, but a little late. Okay, good. We, we have a quorum present. Let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before we get started on the next agenda item, we are on television tonight, uh, there you go. so we need the microphone up, and uh, we won't be live tonight. It'll be rebroadcasted <coughs> tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, next, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the June 14, 2011 meeting. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Chair votes aye. Next on the agenda, we have a public forum uh, on any agenda item. Does anybody wish to speak? No public forum. Uh, next, we have uh, chairman's comments. <clears throat> Just want to go over briefly something that I send out to everyone a week or so ago, and that is uh, <clears throat> my expectations and the committee protocols for the committee. Uh, over the years, I've chaired many committees, uh, some in city government, some in professional organizations that I belong to, and whenever I've chaired a committee in whatever role it's been, I've always uh, had some expectation for, expectations for my committee members and some of them are just basic house, housekeeping things. Uh, if, you, if you can uh, at, all, at all possible arrive about 10 minutes before the meeting, that would be helpful. If you're unable to attend a meeting, I would appreciate it if you would call the city clerk's office or my cell phone uh, as soon as possible. If you know you're not gonna be able to attend or even if you're gonna be running late, I got a, at least one of those calls tonight. Uh, if you don't have my cell phone number, I think most of you do, but if any of you don't have my cell phone number, I'll give it to you after the meeting. Another thing that's important with the committee of the whole that we need a minimum of nine older persons in order to conduct city business. And I would appreciate it getting back to attendance that we have no unexcused absences. I would appreciate it if you'd keep your cell phones and other electronic devices turned off and out of sight. Uh, it's also very important to come to the meeting prepared to be an active participant by having read all of the documents prior to the meeting if possible. And please be prepared to be an active participant at all discussions. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's very, we, we talk about some very important topics with these committee of the whole meetings. And uh, it's very important that all of you try to participate and, and ask questions. It makes for a better meeting. Uh, similar to uh, other city committees that I've chaired, I will vote last on all roll call votes. Uh, if you wish to speak, similar, sa same decorum as at council meetings, I'd appreciate it if you if you're push your button and I will we'll recognize you. Uh, each older person will be allowed to speak three times in any agenda item. A full discussion of each agenda item will take place with no time limit. Most meetings will not exceed two hours in length. Uh, and for some of the uh, newer people on the council, the mayor is not a member of the committee of the whole. The mayor is welcome to attend the meeting and will be seated in, in the public seating area. The mayor may speak at the chairman's discretion. For maximum transparency for the citizens of Sheboygan, I will attempt to have all committee of the whole meetings televised on channels 95 or 990. A public forum on agenda item, uh, <coughs> on agenda items for each committee the whole meeting I will be holding a public forum uh, people will be able to speak up to three minutes on any agenda item and there will be no time extensions uh, I believe if we all 
uh, work together on these uh, protocols. It'll make for an efficient and professional operation of the committee for the benefit of the cities of Sheboygan, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you very much. <coughs> the next thing we have for discussion only, uh, item number seven, is an update on the city of Sheboygan's implementation of State of Wisconsin Act 10. And if I could call up uh, Tom Rice, the city's HR and labor relations director, and Tom will be uh, doing the next couple of agenda items for us. Tom? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could I draw your attention to the handout that's at your place? <clears throat> um, what this is, it goes a little bit beyond the Act 10, but I wanted to make sure you were up to date in terms of where we are. The Wisconsin Retirement Fund contributions, 5.8%, uh, has already begun for transit. As you may know, we had a uh, a new contract go into effect for transit that carries us through 1231 of 2012. Their deductions became effective August 1st. Non reps and elected became effective on 9 9, the payroll coming in at 9 9 this year. All of the others will become effective on 1 1 12. Any questions on the retirement fund contributions? Okay, medical insurance contributions of 12%. Transit began 8111 because they are the only collective bargaining agreement that was agreed to for that deduction date. We have decided to defer any other increase uh, contributions until 1 1 of 12 uh, when all of our uh, non represented employees, all of our elected officials, uh, all of our other unions, with the exception perhaps of fire and police, we have to see what happens in negotiations, will take place. Benefit plan changes. We're in the process of putting together the medical plan going forward for 2012. In addition to that, we're also looking at some rules and regulations changes as well as overtime changes. All of those uh, are going to go into effect on 1-1 one, one of 12. However, uh, as Jim and I have talked through this whole thing, uh, we want to make sure that we have those changes finished by October 1st, obviously for budget purposes so that he can put it in the budget, but also so that we can communicate with our current employees. Uh, what we decide to do with some of those benefit programs may determine whether or not some of those employees choose to retire early or not. So we've made that commitment to them. Policy and procedure changes. Um, since we're starting basically with a clean slate in many respects, uh, we're going to be reviewing all of the policies and procedures. I'm, I just cited a couple of call-in procedure, attendance policy, and those kinds of things uh, will be published and made available effective 1-1 one, one of 12. And finally, uh, the Act 10 calls for us to put in place a grievance and appeal procedure. Uh, that grievance and appeal procedure has been written. It will go to the Salaries and Grievance Committee on Monday night, and uh, they will act upon that, and I would suspect it will come to council fairly soon, and we'll get that thing going. So any questions in terms of where we are? Any questions from the committee? Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a couple questions, I, I guess, on the, on the whole form. Um, can you explain the process on these changes? Are the changes that you're going to be looking to implement on these dates, are those going to be coming back to us for our approval through a committee process, or is that something you just dictate? No. All of the changes will go through salaries and grievance. Okay. Um, at this point in time, I've not talked to Steve in terms of what have to go through council. Generally speaking, changes like policy and procedure uh, and benefit plan changes go through the salaries and grievance. Insurance type of things are uh, submitted to the council for your approval. Okay. And then my other question is, you had brought up uh, fire police are, are on the bottom here, but uh, fire and police are exempt from some of these or from most of these is my understanding? Well, the grievance, the grievance and appeal procedure uh, is already in place in both of the fire and police contracts. So they're not going to be, unless we negotiate the new one, but they're not going to be affected by, by the new one for, that we have for the city. Um, 
We're entering into negotiations with both the firemen and the policemen starting next week. And um, so they're not covered under the WRF contributions. They're not covered under the medical insurance contributions. Uh, the only thing that Act 10, or actually the new budget did, was made uh, medical program design features non-negotiable. So in other words, we can put together the medical plan and that's what it is. We can talk about premium uh, rates in terms of how we share that premium and so forth, but as far as the actual plan itself, that's not an item for negotiation. Okay, then my last question on the fire and police side of that, the non-represented or the non-rep employees in those departments, they're gonna be taking effect on these dates. Have we considered the effect of, or I guess, it, can you explain the, how that effect will, the comparison effect? Um, are you gonna have non-represented employees, supervisors in these departments that are gonna be making less overall comp uh, package compared to the union worker and have we considered that effect of again a supervisor who's now going to be making less to the than the, the officer that's getting we have we have taken a look at uh, compression studies I'd rather can you hold your question until we talk about the pay plan sure. because I think it'd be more appropriate to that okay. any other questions uh, Alderman Hammond Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's, uh, and Tom, if you can correct me if I'm uh, wrong, but I, um, maybe a comment to your point as well, Alderman Van Akron, is some of these things aren't optional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if the 5.8, those types of things, they have to happen. Doesn't matter what the end result of their paycheck is. They just, 9 9, it's the first pay period after 8 25. That's when they come into effect. So, your point duly noted, but it's not like we have as a council an option to change that. So, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Thank, thank you, Alderman Van Akron. Any other questions? I have a couple, uh, Tom. Uh, under the uh, WRF contributions, the 5.8%, uh, currently uh, elected officials are contributing more than the 11.6. Will the elected officials be uh, contributing half of what they're contributing now? That's correct. That's correct. So I think it's 6.65 or something is what it looks like going forward. Okay. And then the other thing on the um, two things on the medical insurance contributions, uh, I thought I read in the in the bill unless it was changed that it was going to be the, the percentage was going to be 12.6%. Uh, Twelve percent was what is in the Act Ten bill, yes. and I, 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 the twelve point six was with the government insurance plan that they have for Madison. We don't have that insurance plan. Yeah. And then the other thing is on the medical contributions for transit. It starts eight one. Uh, now I know on the WRF contributions that was mandated, as Alderman Hammond just mentioned, is the medical insurance contributions. Uh, mandated that that start in September, or is that at the option of the community that we can start that on 112 or 1112 rather than in September of this year? Those employees covered under the government insurance portion, the program for insurance, mandated as of 9 1 or 9, whatever it was, since we are not covered under that program, we aren't, don't fall underneath that mandate. We can choose to do what we want to do. And to, to, to give you the rationale behind the decision, none of the bargaining units thus far would be contributing any more this year to the insurance. Uh, as we talk about the compensation plan going forward in the non-rep area, we didn't feel that that was fair to take and penalize them as well going forward. So that's why we chose to start everything as of one one twelve. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Tom. We'll okay. have you back up in a few minutes for part two. Uh, next, we have uh, items uh, for discussion and possible recommendation of the Common Council. The first one is uh, agenda item number eight, communication number 2-11-12, Council document number 523, submitting a communication from Michael Toth, being an article from the Waukee Journal Sentinel entitled Trainee feels the heat, sweat, and fear. Uh, I initiated this uh, article 
from the Journal Sentinel to the Council uh, after it was submitted to me by Mr. Toth. And Mr. Toth, I understand, is a uh, member of the Sheboygan Fire Department. And I know this, this uh, article went before Public Protection and Safety, and I did uh, call Mr. Toth and asked him to appear tonight if he wanted to uh, make any comments on this article. Uh, Chief, if, if you had a chance to look at this article, are you familiar with it at all or not? I read it in the paper, but that was a while ago. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was quite an interesting article on, on the training procedures for, for firefighters and uh, what they go through in, in getting their training. Is there any questions or comments from the council on this, on this article? Otherwise, I'll, look, I'll entertain a motion. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll make a motion to file. Second. We have a motion and a second to file. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. Next, we have RC number 86 11 12, Council Document number 729. Uh, your committee who met and discussed the draft compensation program for non-represented employees and after further review based on a positive recommendation from the Salary and Grievances Committee recommends referral of this document uh, to the Committee on Finance and the Committee of the Whole. Uh, Mr. Rice, you want to step up and cover this again? I know this went to uh, finance at our last meeting and I believe we uh, did we put this on hold, uh, Alderman Hammond, or did we just... Uh... You're correct, Mr. Chairman. We put it on hold until this meeting, and we'll bring it up. It'll come back on Monday. Okay. Okay, Please. Mr. Chairman. All of you should have in front of you two documents. One of them is a comparison of the old to the new plan, and the other one, for your benefit, I didn't know whether you... I thought you had received copies of the pay plan, but if you hadn't, here it is. Um, as I took a look at the, the non-represented pay plan, I think basically it was a very good plan going forward. There were two, as I, thought, as I saw, primary problems with it. One of them was it was based primarily on across-the-board increases in order to maintain equity between employees, which didn't allow for uh, either segregating a, a group of employees to get a raise or not get a raise and those kinds of things. And as I, as I took a look at that, I thought to myself, based upon what's happening in business and industry today, uh, it made more sense to me to take and move from uh, that kind of a pay plan to what I call a pay for performance plan. And the plan is based upon the fact that you are compensated vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a pay increase based upon your performance. And your performance is evaluated by your supervisor based upon goals and objectives that you and your supervisor mutually agree to. So as you and your supervisor agree to goals and objectives, uh, the employee understands full well, this is what's expected of me and this is what my performance is gonna be rated on. So the employee, rather than wondering for the course of a year's period of time how I'm doing in my, in my supervisor's eyes, all he, he or she has to do is take a look at their objectives and say, how am I doing in meeting these goals and objectives? So in my opinion, the heart of the program is the goals and objectives being worked out mutually between the supervisor and the subordinate. So rather than having across the board increases universally, it would be merit increases based upon performance, which are based upon performance goals and objectives mutually established. Secondly, little use of merit increases in the old plan. Uh, the new proposal is it allows for the opportunity to use across the board increases if there are egregious disparities, but basically there wouldn't be any across the board increases. They would be based upon uh, merit and performance. Thirdly, performance evaluations with no relative value. I have to share with you honestly that the performance evaluation program in the city is one where you check a few boxes and that's it. <coughs> to a performance evaluation program of great value. And I think again, to reiterate to you, it's the goals and objectives setting part of the program that's the heart of it. So if the council adopts the pay plan, 
Then we're going to put in place training for managers and supervisors that talks about how to effectively establish goals and objectives. Because a meaningless goal is become more proficient in arrests procedure. Pick on the cops. Now that means nothing. How do I, how do I evaluate myself? You know, you talk about specific goals and objectives. Increase uh, or decrease overtime by 10% or something like that, where it's measurable, people understand, or several different measures, you know, outstanding would be by 10%, uh, very good would be 8%, satisfactory would be 5%. So the employee can walk away knowing exactly what he or she is gonna be rated on and how to accomplish those goals. The across the board increases were to the midpoint of the grade in the old pay plan. As the midpoints changed, employees never really increased based upon their position within the salary grade. This plan calls for a merit percent increase to their actual current pay. To go back for just a minute, the pay plan is based upon a minimum, a midpoint, and a maximum. The midpoint is targeted to be the fair market value for the job. So if we are going to hire an accountant, if I would do a salary survey, I would take a look at not only the municipal uh, comparatives that we have and what's happening in that sector, but also the business sector and say, hey, if I'm going to recruit from the Sheboygan, Milwaukee, Green Bay, Madison area, what can I reasonably expect to pay? That's where we need to set our midpoints because that's the fair market value of the job. And then you take a look at the qualifications of the person who we end up hiring, where they fit into fully qualified, and chances are they're gonna start a little bit less than what the midpoint is and have the opportunity to work up. The goal is to get your employees to the midpoint of the job if they're performing in a satisfactory or above average manner. So the only way to do that is to give the increase based upon their actual salary rather than upon the midpoint. Increases for below standard performance were in the old pay plan vis-a-vis -vis the across the board increase. Increases in the new play plan for standard performance and above. I think this is critical because why in the world would we pay or give someone an increase if they're performing below standard? It just makes no sense. So if you'll notice in the, in the, uh, the plan itself, I think it calls for a 1.5% increase at standard and then two and then two and a half. And that's something that would come before the council every year, that grid, if it changes or if it's proposed to be changed. But basically it's based upon if you want to increase your pay, you have to perform at a standard level or above. And finally, all employees received increases under the old pay plan, under the new one, only employees who met objectives received the increase. I, from my experience, there's, there's been a commonly accepted practice within the city government that you can virtually never get fired, which means that you don't have to perform at above average levels. And over the course of time, we've tolerated that. That's not an indictment against city employees at all. All it says is that we need to expect our employees to perform at a level that that employee and their supervisor agree upon. And if they don't perform to that level, they shouldn't be warranting a merit increase. So those are the, the six basic changes in comparing and contrasting the two uh, questions. Alderman Hammond. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Tom, for putting this together. Just a, a couple quick um, questions um, in 13 parts, so never mind, no one's ever seen that movie. <laughs> um, first off, um, I, I like the idea of having merit-based pay, um, and obviously we've got many different functions that go on in the city. Is it going to be the department, and I know you said mutually agreed upon, but are these going to be metrics-based? You know, goals are, are kind of you know, nebulous depending on the department. Um, are there going to be some hard, fast metrics that are going to have to be achieved? Um, that's, how, what the, how that's what the training is going to involve yeah. in terms of setting meaningful goals and objectives. And what does that mean? You and I both know that the only way to set a meaningful goal is have some kind of a metric in there, a measurement tool. 
And I think regardless of whether you're, you're a garbage collector or somebody else, you can have measurable goals and objectives. Absolutely. And to follow up on that, um, obviously if we're going to a merit-based pay system instead of an across-the-board system, um, you know, it's important for uh, employees to know where they stand. And obviously they can look back at their goals or metrics. Um, will there be implemented a, um, you know, an in-progress review, if you will, halfway through the year or quarterly? You know, is there anything like that envisioned for this so that an employee comes back and gets a substandard and says, well, you know, no one talked to me throughout the year about things that I wasn't doing well or correctly or what have you. And again, I realize the employee's got some responsibility there to look at the metrics and say, yeah, I'm not doing as well. How can I improve? But is there going to be a system for that? Supervisors and managers are going to be reminded once again that it's their res the performance of their subordinates is their responsibility. So if someone isn't performing up to a standard level, it's the supervisor or manager's responsibility to talk to that employee before the annual performance evaluation comes up. So I'm going to urge them at minimum at least six month review, if not three and six and nine, at least for the first year or two. So just to follow up on that, if I may, then for the supervisor or manager, obviously one of the metrics for them would be their performance of their own employees um, ongoing. Obviously, they're not exempt from, from this as well. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Alderman Versi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tom, thanks again. You know, like we said, in salary and grievance, too, about getting this together. Um, the only question I had was, as far as department heads go, who's reviewing department heads? This is all for the department heads to review them, their subordinates. Who's reviewing our department heads? Well, at this point in time, the mayor would do that. Okay. Because they report to the mayor. With, obviously, if we put this into place, the mayor and I are going to sit down and together we'll put objectives together for his department heads. Okay. Because it has to start at the top and flow down. If it fails there, the system will fail. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Versi. Alderman Belt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the merit increases, are they going to be percentage based? Yes. With one exception, with one exception. Okay. Generally speaking, they're going to be percentage increases, except when an employee reaches the maximum for his or her grade. If they are at the maximum for their grade, rather than increasing the maximum of the grade if we don't need to, what the program calls for is a lump sum payment that they would get. Well, the reason that I ask is because uh, if, if you have an employee making say 20,000 a year and comes in at an above standard, he could possibly make, get an increase of less than somebody who's making 40,000 a year and comes in at standard. He would get a bigger increase than the person who would come in at above standard making less money. That's correct. That's fair. Well, I have to go back and say, why are you paying the one person twenty thousand and the other one forty thousand? Because it, it should be based upon the responsibilities of the job they have. What if the person just started and he's working his way up and he's doing a fantastic job? Then he should be paid at an above average or outstanding increase. But rate. his increases aren't going to be as much as somebody who's making a lot more money. Well, you're absolutely correct, but you have to understand that all pay systems are based upon pay for the job. So you, the, the, the greater the responsibility that the person has, the higher the pay. Why not just have a set fee or a set pay plan right across the board for s standard and above standard and above that, uh, say a dollar, two dollars, three dollars an hour right across the board? Everybody knows what kind of increase they're going to get if they do a certain amount of work. Well, you have that, except this is a percentage instead of a flat dollar amount. I understand what you're saying, but you know, I guess the argument to that is: is a is a above average performer who is a department head the value of that performer as the same as a garbage collector who is performing at an above average rate? There's a great, great, much greater responsibility with somebody who's a department head. Therefore, the pay increase should be commensurate with the responsibilities and the performance. You could, you could set it up different uh, departments also, department heads. This is what they get, you know, um, 
I'm, I'm just strictly opposed to the percentages. That's, I never agreed with them. I don't, don't agree with them. Uh, I, I prefer across the board. Uh, well, that's the problem we had with the old pay plan because when we got into that situation, we had across the board increases, but there were people who weren't performing that or were at a higher level that the council felt didn't, they didn't deserve increases. They didn't need increases. And that was primarily at the department head level. But there was no vehicle or mechanism for them to deny an increase to that group of employees because the plan called for across the board for everyone. But you could still do it with merit increases with a flat fee. You don't have to do it with percentages. Then I would challenge you, tell me how I could put a flat fee together for the various pay grades. I'd have to sit down and look at it. It'd probably be based on a percentage. Up front, possibly. But you take a look at it, and then you can set it for each. Because the person on the bottom of the salary grade is never going to get to the same. He will never get the same increases as somebody above him. No, because the job, the value of the job that he or she has is less to the city than the one at a higher grade level. And I'm only talking about the technical, technical parts of their job, what they do, their responsibilities and so forth. So everybody in each salary grade makes exactly the same amount today? It depends upon where, you know, because today it's based upon where you started, your longevity, and how many increases you've had, and those kinds of things. So if you're a truck driver, you start at a, a rate, you get another increase after six months, you get an increase after a year, another year, and another year, and then you get longevity increases after five, 10, 15, and 20. So all truck drivers don't make the same amount. It depends upon not your performance, it depends upon how long you've been here. I'm not sure I agree with that either, but well, that's I wasn't I wasn't here when those contracts were negotiated. <laughs> Nor was I. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Belt. Uh, Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Tom, and uh, just to kind of maybe follow up on uh, Alderman Van Akron's uh, question about the compression, um, how was the ten percent determined? The ten percent really came about as a result of the, of the former plan. Okay. Uh, thinking that a 10% differential between uh, the highest paid employee and their supervisor was fair and reasonable. Um, you can argue the percentage down till, till the cows go home in terms of what it should be. I guess I was just curious if there was some, you know, case history or, or some kind of, or if it was just kind of a nebulous number based off of. Most salary administration programs will talk about a 10%. It's kind of a standard, but there are enough that vary back and forth that it could be 8 or it could be 12, depending upon the particular organization. The one thing I do like about this um, the compression is it's, I think under our current play plan, it's required. Here, yes. there is an option for a supervisor if, for example, the council doesn't feel, or salaries and grievances, I believe, doesn't feel that, you know, that raise does not have to occur. So based upon get, performance. Correct. That's, I mean, if you have a, a substandard supervisor, and just because somebody's making within that 10%, it's not an automatic pay increase. And yep. I, think that's a, I think that's important, because um, I think we all know in various departments there are some supervisory challenges. Um, and I think this helps us, gives us a tool to deal with that. Well, I have to share with you that uh, we did some work with a, a compensation consultant uh, out of Madison. and. Um, I sent this program to him about two months ago, and he said, if you get this adopted, you will be the first municipality in Wisconsin to have a pay for performance program. So this is cutting edge for municipalities. For those of you in the business world, this is something that you've had for years. But in municipalities, this is cutting edge, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Alderman Van Akron. To follow up on Alderman Hammond's follow up of my original question. <laughs> <laughs> to follow up, to follow up, to follow up. To Correct. Um, can you touch on the compression rates? I, I found the, the, that part of that to be on page 13, um, but that specifically deals with the pay. Now, if we are requiring 
the non-representative employees to make these contributions. Obviously, I'm assuming they're not making these contributions now. Their overall comp, uh, compensation packages are going to be taking a hit based on that. Is there, is there any thought or is there anything in place that we're looking at keeping that overall compression rate? I mean, because again, if, if, if our non-representative employees are now paying these contributions, and in the police department and the fire department, the line officers or the, the, the union representative employees are not, pay-wise, their compression hasn't changed, but their overall compensation package obviously has changed. Is there any, have we looked into or is there anything in place to address that? Well, let me give you a little history and then I'll address your question going forward. When we did the, the uh, compensation study for the city, and that was uh, done about uh, six months ago, uh, we took three categories. We took our non-represented employees. We took our uh, managers uh, and supervisors, and then we took department heads. The non-represented employees were found to be at or above the average rate of pay for their jobs, which says that that group of employees are being paid fairly for the work they do. The department heads were found to be at or close to the midpoint average rate for their jobs. The supervisors were below. So we know we've got a compression problem right up front. When I went back and I looked at the overtime, I found that in some cases, not a lot, but in some cases, employees were making 10 to 15 percent more than the supervisor with the overtime. So that's an area that we need to address, very definitely. But, and this is the double-edged sword, uh, it was touched upon in terms of the quality of our supervisors and what we expect. And I think we need to make those corrections, but at the same time, we need to significantly increase our expectations for our supervisors. You know, when you think about going forward, the world in, as of 1-1-2012 is going to be much different than it was in 2011. In terms of their ability to supervise, their ability to manage the workforce and those kinds of things. Uh, one of the things that we're going to change is the overtime and how it's paid. At least uh, that's proposed right now. And, you know, as we negotiate contracts, I can assure you that's going to be on the table because we're going to go to pay for anything over 40, not some of the overtime pay regulations that are in contracts today. But part of that is simply the supervisors managing the whole work process. And quite frankly, that has been lackluster at best in the past. So that's part of the problem because if you're not paying close attention to the overtime or stopping overtime, it's just gonna to continue to roll and obviously it rolls up and people make a lot of money for for many times not doing what they should be. So that's part of the problem. Going forward, I think we do need to do one assessment before the end of this year, and that is, again, taking a look at our supervisors and the, the compensation for their people below them. Consider what we're going to do with the overtime rate and the potential impact that has. And where it makes sense, make adjustments or plan to make adjustments in 2012 based upon six months of performance. Again. As far as I'm concerned, this entire program is based upon satisfactory or above performance. If that doesn't happen, if they can't make the adjustments that I think they need to make going forward, then they're not gonna, there's going to be a compression problem that's going to remain. The compression problem is also going to be there if a supervisor performs at a below average rate and we continue to keep him in or her. Correct. I, I guess my concern is for the supervisor who is getting an outstanding um, merit based pay. Um, come January 1st, they're going to start making these contributions, or actually come um, in September, they're going to start making these contributions. And like I said, their overall compensation compression rates are, are going to shrink. Yes. Um, you know, th this addresses the pay side of that, which um, is the base pay not dealing with the overtime issue. But I, I guess I, I would like to have some kind of an idea if there is a way to address that, whether that is increasing the pay because we're, as Alderman Hammond pointed out, we're required to have these contributions. But I, I think it is appropriate to look at, at the end of the day, when these contribu contributions come out, these are coming off your check. Your, your check is going to get smaller and your, your compensation rate 
is, is going to shrink and those compressions are you're not going to have those same compression rates especially in the police department and the fire department from the represented to the non-represented employees I don't disagree with you but remember it's a timing issue you're only talking about four months because everybody else is going to begin the contribution as of January 1st so you're talking about yeah, if you have a truly a true compression issue I'm going to talk about their base rate you know of pay then compare that to a, a total earnings overtime rate with their subordinates that's what you compare everybody's going to take a hit as of January 1st because well, no, you have to pay for fire administrators don't pay in not at all no okay so you know depending upon how our negotiations go but everybody else is going to take that pay hit either in September or in January that's going to happen so I, I hear what you're saying the problem is that we you know do we do it up front and give the pay or do we take and, and put the program in place and say all right we'll take a look at the compression issues but it would be done on an individual basis based upon performance and I really think it's important that we say to our supervisors the world is different and you have to change you have to step up and take on the responsibility which means managing your people effectively and managing your overtime and doing the kinds of things that you haven't had to spend time doing before as an example in, in one of our departments employees don't want to come to work so they call and tell a clerk I'm not coming to work and that's it never talk to a supervisor supervisor doesn't know whether they're coming in until he or she walks in the door you know that's going to change employees will call their supervisor if they can't come to work if they're not excused by your supervisor it's going to be considered as a wall absence without permission or absence without leave I mean it's, it's just the way it is how can a supervisor plan the work that they have to do if they don't know whether their people are going to be there so anything else Alderman Van Hecker I think I'm good thank you <coughs> Alderman Koth uh, thank you chairman uh, Tom I guess my question is as far as the budget budgeting for this is this a, a line item then every department had budgets for merit increases I know that uh, Jim has put in a, a merit increase dollar you know, a tentative dollar in the budget right now uh, but I it, it, we have to wait and see what's going to happen with the CPI as soon as we find out what that number is uh, right now it's hard you know so hovering around two and a half percent so obviously that's what we will negotiate with our unions because that's the only thing we can negotiate with them but more importantly uh, how that's going to impact you know if we if we go in 2012 without any any increases because of the financial situation of the city and we can agree to that you know then it's a different story but yes to answer your question there is there is money plugged into the 2012 budget at this point in time for merit increases any other questions uh, I've got a, a couple Tom uh, on the performance evaluation form on page 21 and then on page 22, uh, I read this over a few days ago, but uh, just to refresh my memory, uh, will the supervisor be filling out the form and then go over it with the employee? Uh, is that the way it's going to work? Yes. Uh, I know some businesses do it this way. I knew I used to do this when I had when I had my small professional office. Is that I did a I did a performance evaluation on my uh, on my office manager, my secretary, once a year, and I gave her the performance evaluation to fill out, and then uh, she filled it out, and then I filled it out separately, and then we had a meeting, mm -hmm. and I found that, well, I found it kind of interesting to see where she thought her strong points were or weak points, and then vice versa. I thought it was a very useful tool, just rather than having the supervisor fill it out. And then have the imp well as, as we're thinking of doing it here it might be something to consider to have the employee fill it out before the meeting and then have the employee and the supervisor kind of mesh and see what each other's thoughts are effective supervisors will do exactly that you know 
When I came to design a performance evaluation form several years ago, my boss asked me to do that in another lifetime, and I said, it's going to be very simple. What have you done well? What do you need to improve upon? And what are your goals and objectives for next year? Because that's really all that employees need to know. But this is designed primarily for verbiage, for dialogue. You know, so there's not checking of boxes and all that kind of stuff, simply because it's, number one, it's too easy to fill out. Number two, it's done at the last minute. This requires some thought and it requires some dialogue between the employee and the supervisor. And that's why I put this form together. It's fairly simple, but it can be as long as you want it to be, depending upon the employee and the performance levels and the objectives you're trying to accomplish. So it gives the supervisor or the manager maximum flexibility in terms of what he's going to put in. Could that, could that be something that you might want to discuss when you have these meetings with the supervisors and department heads that that may be an effective way to do it? Absolutely. Hand it out first and then the it, employee fills it out, then they fill it out, then they have their meeting. This is a tool for them to use. Okay. Oh. Then I have one other question. Uh, when we get into these more sophisticated performance evaluations, and let's say an employee puts on there, I want to move up in the department but in order to do that, I'm going to have to get an associate degree or, or I'm going to need my bachelor's degree to do that or I may need a master's degree. Has it ever been uh, discussed that the city start an employee tuition reimbursement plan like some corporations do? Uh, I know, it's like for example, some companies, if you get an A, you get 100% tuition reimbursement, a B, 80%, C, 70%, and below that, nothing. And then also usually written into those uh, tuition reimbursement plans is that if you are going, uh, if you're going to uh, participate in that as an employee, you agree to stay with the city two years or three years after you get your bachelor's degree so that the city would get some value as corporations do for helping that employee better themselves so they can take advantage of that education. Uh, I know, you know, budgets are tight and all that kind of thing, but I think, uh, something that we may want to consider well one of our contracts already has that you know in the police department but I agree with you and I think that's something that's sorely lacking in the city but frankly you know with the economic situation we find ourselves in today you know where do you spend the money and where do you get the money from uh, one of the focuses that I think you've already heard from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater is an emphasis upon training and I think that's one of the goals that we have to set for us next year in terms of at least beginning citywide training for employees. So that's, I agree with you. Uh, I think that's something that we should, we should put on the agenda if we can do. Um, if, we, if we wait till money is available, it'll never be available. So I, it's going to be in my budget going forward. Whether it stays in there, we'll see. But I think it's very important. Thank you. Any other questions from the... Uh Committee, Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, just one quick question. Um, is there a veto on this performance review? Again, we've talked, uh, you know, some of our supervisors may or may not be real good. Um, you know, my concern is, you know, a supervisor evaluating a, an employee and everybody under his command or under his um, uh, supervisory range ends up with fives. Is there a veto by the department head that says, "Well, whoa, 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 you know, this, this, you know, this isn't the case. I've seen this in particular employee work, and it's certainly not a five. Um, is there a, a process of veto, if you will? Actually, there's two. Uh, the department head is one, and HR department is the second. And if it gets really bad, the salaries and grievance will be the third. My, re my response to those kinds of things is uh, if you only have $500 to give out in pay increases this year, tell me how you're going to do it. And don't tell me you're going to give everybody 50 bucks. You know, you, you have to make decisions. Same thing should apply to your people. Yeah, I kind of, I don't know if anybody's ever read the book by Jack Walsh about how GE has done things, but... Uh, you know, very similar, the top 20%, actually they're probably about the top 40% get raises, the middle 20%, you know, they don't get anything. Bottom or the next 20% are just happy to be working, the bottom 20% get cut. And, you know, again, I, I kind of envision something like that where, you know, the, the merit raises are really designed for that top 40% or 
as they should be. Exactly. As they should exactly. be. Right. You know. So and th and that's how this is set up. But yeah, uh, if if the department head or the manager wants to keep good employees, he better make sure he gives them raises. My my concern is again that you get a supervisor because this is going to be new to a lot of them to have to you know now actually evaluate based off of merit and they're say well everybody's a five because I don't want any issues. That's right. You know and now you you're you're giving. Well, I struggled with the rating system on, 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 the, on page 22 because it's a five-point rating system. Mm -hmm. And a typical bell-shaped curve, it's up in three, you know, and I said, hmm. But we settled for five as opposed to four. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. I have one more. I have uh, Alderman Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On these uh, evaluations, the supervisor fills it out and goes and gives it to the employee, or does his manager review them first? Typically speaking, the supervisor fills it out, discusses it with the employee, and then it goes to the manager. Um, it could go to the manager first for his, his review. Where I'm at, we give out evaluations to the employees, but beforehand, our manager goes through them all to make sure, you know, we're not, Overrating the halo effect, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's wise. You know, uh, at times you're supervising a crew of 20 people. Sometimes that gets a little bit laborious. But I think for the first few times, I would encourage them to do that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Alderman Belt. Uh, I have one more thing, uh, Tom, and that is uh, there was some discussion about. Uh, this back, I think, in 2007 or 2008, about having a separate pay plan for uh, the uh, department heads and the and the non reps. Uh, do we have a pay plan for the department heads, or are we going to be working on one? Where are we with that? Uh, I hadn't anticipated having a separate pay plan for department heads. It was all incorporated in here. Okay. Um, to me, they should gov be governed by the same policies and procedures that every other employee is. Okay. So. Now, I noticed on the document it said here that this got a positive recommendation from the Salary and Grievance Committee. Uh, would it be uh, helpful for you, Tom, to get a uh, some kind of a recommendation, either yay or nay, from the Committee of the Whole to be referred back to the Council? Did you hear anything tonight where you may want to tweak this a little further, or could you tweak this even if we gave you a favorable recommendation tonight? I think the tweaking, Jim, would, and what I heard coming from the council would be part of the training that we would give supervisors and how they use the tools. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm not that familiar with the parliamentary procedure and what has to happen. What I'm looking for ultimately is for the council to approve it okay. so we can move forward, because the training is going to take place be at the end, by the end of this year, it has to. Mm -hmm. And so the end of the year is getting very busy with a lot of things that have to happen, so. Okay, thank you. Is there any other final questions or comments for Mr. Rice? Alderman Rinflesh. No, thank you. Um, I was just gonna make the motion to uh, forward on with a positive recommendation to the Common Council, the pay plan. We have a motion by Alderman Rinflesh and a second by Alderman Hammond to pass this on to the Council with a favorable recommendation. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. Thank you, Tom. Next we have on the agenda, <coughs> uh, before, I make, before I make this motion to go into closed session, I think we're gonna take about a five minute recess. We'll come back at 7.30 because our television man back here has to make sure we're off the air before we go into closed session. So we'll take a five minute break. We'll reconvene at 7.30.